I think it's time we talk about calories again. Hey everyone, I'm just hopping in here to talk about the elephant in the room. That is last week's video on calorie counting and why I decided to ultimately take it down. So first of all, I feel like there's just like a lot of focus placed on strict calorie counting in the weight loss space online um, as like the obvious solution. And I see a lot of TikTok bros claiming that, you know, weight loss is just calories in minus calories out. It's just simple math. But my goal with this video is really to dive deep into the science and ultimately to point out what seems to never get discussed here, which is that calorie counting is actually not simple nor perfect math. Our team looked extensively into the research. We spent a lot of time on this video and we were all really shocked at all the inaccuracies in a process that is often framed as kind of the gold standard science here in the weight loss world. Now from reading the comments, it did seem like a lot of you were upset by the video because perhaps it seemed like I was discounting a method that had worked for a lot of you, or maybe I was kind of making you feel like calorie counting was inherently wrong. This was absolutely not my intention, and I am so sorry that I ultimately missed the mark on that delivery. As I mentioned in the original video, and I will reiterate again right here, calorie counting can be a helpful tool for a lot of people to lose weight. I fully acknowledge that. I've seen it happen. But my vision for this video was to validate the experiences of so many others who maybe have not had success with this method. People who have been told that they must be lying because calories in minus calories out is just simple math. It's science. It's fact. But as you're about to find out if you watch this video, it's actually not fact. It's imprecise, it's messy, it's individualized, and ultimately because of its imperfections, it's something that I don't believe we should be obsessing over. This is not the only form of data that we can lean on to inform our food choices. I also heard from the comments that some of you maybe had felt lost not knowing what else to do if you don't count calories. At the end of the original video, I shared a link to some of my more gentle non-calorie counting weight loss tips. General calorie knowledge can also be part of this without strict calorie counting. But since I get that a lot of you guys don't watch to the end, often my kind of more summarized, unbiased, kind of more balanced conclusion often does get missed as I did actually originally link to these tips there too. So I'm gonna leave the link right here again in case you wanna check that video out now and then come back to watch this video. I'm ultimately on vacation right now, just like trying to sleep and de-stress and manage my mental health. So it was just easier at the time to just take the video down so that I didn't have to deal with it when I was trying to have a, a nice holiday with my family. But I heard from so many of you on my community page how positively impactful and enlightening this video was and how it helped to validate so many of your past experiences or inform some of your future choices. So here we are. She's going back up, but I've added in some quick clarifying edits. All right, folks, let's take a deep breath and let's try to keep an open mind. These words are meant solely as food for thought. But of course you can pause the screen or look at the description to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating, as I will be talking about calories and weight loss. So please feel free to skip this video if it's not supportive to your journey. So I had originally added that clip in at the start of the original video before I uploaded it um, and it still got a negative reaction from a lot of you. I don't really know how much more explicit I can be about my intentions here, but I do acknowledge that it can feel like a real attack for someone to criticize your diet, especially when maybe you've personally had a really positive experience with it. Again, 
If you love calorie counting and it serves you well, I am always going to be supportive of your journey. I'm actually going to add an extra trigger warning here today because this video is likely to be particularly triggering to any of my ED warriors. It is absolutely not my intention to trigger more aggressive restriction because of some of the inherent flaws of calorie counting that I'm going to be discussing. So I strongly suggest just skipping this video if you have any thought that this might be a risky topic for you. And if you are not already subscribed, hit that sub button and follow me over on TikTok and Instagram at Abby's Kitchen. All right, so you have heard every weight loss expert on TikTok repeat the same simple mantra. To lose weight, you just need to eat fewer calories than you burn. Calories in, calories out, blah, 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 blah. But does calorie counting for weight loss even work? Okay, editing Abby coming in hot with a little note. I have a feeling this is going to be a very controversial topic. So before you come at me in the comments insisting that I'm an idiot for rejecting the laws of thermodynamics, watch the whole video. I also want to add that this is not meant to discourage people or suggest that calorie counting isn't a good tool for weight loss. For a lot of people, it is a great tool that serves as a guideline that helps people become more mindful about what they're eating. That's not what this video is about. The point of this video is to point out how unabsolute and imprecise calorie counting actually is and why it therefore isn't worthy of meticulous attention or obsession. So let's talk about some of these surprising major flaws in this overstated equation of calories in minus calories out. Problem number one, calorie calculators are kind of very quickly, your total energy needs include resting energy expenditure, or REE, aka the amount of energy that you burn at rest, activity energy used to do stuff and move, and the thermic effect of food, aka the energy used to digest certain foods. And unless you're like maybe Michael Phelps, the REE makes up the lion's share of your total needs. Now, since the gold standard to determine REE, indirect calorimetry, isn't accepted accessible to people outside controlled research experiments, most people rely on generalized formulas. So the Harrison Benedict formula is often the starting point for most online calorie calculators, but it's been known to overestimate your energy needs by up to 27%. Other popular formulas like the Mifflin St. Gior or the Owens equations are also generally inaccurate. I'm stupid, you're smart, I was wrong, you were right. Right. As long as you're willing to admit that now. So just if we look at that one error alone, we could be talking about the difference in a recommendation between like 1500 calories and 1900 calories. Definitely enough to make or break your progress on the scale. Now, the reason why they're so faulty is that there are a number of factors that influence your REE beyond those that go into these predictive formulas. So things like muscle mass, climate, hormonal status, weight history, ethnicity, and even your caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, and medication use. To make it even more difficult, these influencing factors are not always very easy to account for. So for example, even if your body weight, age, height, and sex were all identical in a group, each individual's unique body cell mass will be unique which can also drastically alter REE. Most of these formulas also don't take into consideration the thermal effect of food, which could account for about 10% of your calories. And although they often do try to account for general activity levels, they don't measure specific daily activity and variations in activity. Even Fitbits and Apple Watches are not going to give you super accurate information with a recent study suggesting that wearable devices are generally off off by 27 to 93%. So just knowing how faulty people's calorie goal likely is when they look at their MyFitnessPal app, it feels a little silly and obsolete to be tracking like the squirt of mustard on your sandwich. And that brings me to problem number two, food calorie counts are based on really bad science. Now, first of all, while most of us think of a calorie strictly related to like weight loss or gain, a calorie or kilocalorie more accurately 
is actually the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius at sea level. Now to determine the calories in, let's say an apple, we essentially put it in a device called a bomb calorimeter, light it on fire, and then measure the change in temperature of the water that surrounds it. And this will tell us the amount of gross energy generated. <laughs> This method of calculating the calories of a food was developed way back in the 1800s by a man named Wilbur Atwater. Now, once he calculated the gross energy of a food using a bomb calorimeter, he then fed these foods to study participants and then calculated the energy left over in their stool, urine, and perspiration. So it's like literally calories in versus calories out. But the idea was to give us the amount of energy absorbed AKA metabolized energy. And this is where we got the idea that on average, the body utilizes four calories per gram from carbs and protein and nine calories per gram of fat. As my son would say, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Mm, not so fast. Loads of problems here to unpack. First of all, the study sample that Atwater used was pretty rough. He had a laughably small sample size of just eight participants, and 80% of the time, only three participants were studied. There are a variety of factors that affect how much energy your body extracts from a specific food, and so it's virtually impossible to say that these three random people represent the average human body. One major contributor to how many calories you get from a food is the composition of your gut microbiome. Not only can gut bacteria affect how much energy is harvested from a food, but these microbes can also produce various substances like short chain fatty acids that act as signaling molecules that can also have an effect on appetite and thus caloric intake. Now the type of bacteria in your gut is affected by a number of factors, and we do have evidence to show that lean people's microbiome tends to look very different than obese people's. But none of this was considered at the time. Atwater's calculations also didn't take into consideration the fact that we don't eat macronutrients in isolation, we eat them as a food. And the type of food in which you find them in will also affect their energy content. So for example, the energy in a carbohydrate rich food like flour will be drastically affected by its fiber content. With Atwater's general calculations, fiber is included as part of the energy calculation, even though a significant portion of fiber can't be digested or absorbed. Another great example of this is a food like nuts. For years, we were told to restrict our nut intake because nuts are high in fat and calories. And while it is true that nuts are rich in fat, we only recently learned that the fat is encapsulated in such a way that the body isn't able to absorb a lot of it. So for example, we just discovered that almonds have 32% fewer calories than we previously thought. Like, what else do we not know? I don't know, that's a good question. I don't know. Problem number three, calorie counts are poorly regulated and they're legally allowed to be off. So much later in 1955, folks tried to address some of the issues with the Atwater numbers by introducing specific conversion factors. Now the problem in the food system though, is that regulatory bodies like the FDA don't mandate food manufacturers to use any kind of standardized formula to calculate the nutrient content of their products. There are currently five different approved methods, including Atwater's general factors, which we now know is like super, super flawed. So what we end up with is different manufacturers using different flawed methods, potentially choosing whichever one yields the most favorable numbers. It's a bit of the wild west. Now, when the FDA does check up on a food product to spot test its nutrition label accuracy, it's legally deemed acceptable if the amounts declared on the nutrition facts panel are 120% or less, just saying. Problem number four, calorie counts in a food can actively change. So let's talk about how we actually eat food. Now, when you buy a pack of like ground beef, for example, you're seeing the calorie counts for the raw product. But unless you're 
that guy, that's not gonna be how you're eating a hamburger. When you cook your meat, as most of us do, you actually end up with more calories since heat denatures the meat proteins causing them to unwind and make more energy available to us. Cooking your meat also decreases the structural integrity through gelatinization of collagen in the muscle matrix, making it easier to chew and digest. This means that you don't need as much energy to digest it, so you decrease the thermal effect of food. Now, trigger warning as what I'm about to say may trigger some disordered eating thoughts, but chewing your food also increases the surface area of the food, meaning it's exposed to more digestive enzymes, resulting in a greater digestive and absorption capacity. This may seem inconsequential, but the additional amount of energy that you get from cooked versus raw meat is actually quite substantial. In fact, a lot of historians believe that this has an evolutionary origin, in that using fire to cook food allowed humans to extract additional energy to thrive and evolve. Now, problem number five, we just really suck at estimating how much we eat. Even if we one day had a personalized nutrition fact panel that could tell us exactly how many calories were in each specific food and exactly how efficiently our body would utilize those calories, we probably would still miscalculate what we eat. Okay, kids, I'm gonna need to get some clarification on this. Uh, just keep entering the calculations, I'll be right back. Most studies suggest that we underestimate how much we eat by 25%, and it's likely, honestly, a lot more. So it's for all of these reasons that I feel people are often doing themselves a great disjustice, just like throwing away their innate hunger cues, which, by the way, is the most accurate determinant of your own unique body needs, in favor of a calculation where there's like, a hundred different touch points for error. It's therefore not surprising that research has found that dieting and restriction is a great predictor of future obesity and avoiding dieting actually predicts leanness. But let's say somehow that we found a calorie calculator that gave you a perfectly accurate number and let's say you could reliably count and cut calories. If weight loss comes down to just calories in minus calories out, then we should lose weight in a predictable linear fashion. Cutting 500 calories a day means 3,500 calories in a week, and 3,500 calories is the amount of supposed energy in one pound of fat. Ah, uh, not so fast. Don't Continue. Aside from all of the inefficiencies that we already discussed, this 3,500 calorie number assumes that all weight loss is fat loss, which is not ever how it works. When you lose weight, you lose some fat, but you're also losing muscle and water. With each pound that you lose, or even with each micro shift in your kind of like lean to fat mass, you lower your REE. You've got less body weight to carry around, which reduces the work it is to carry your body. And you've got less muscle mass, which is metabolically active tissue. Your body is actively recalibrating every day, every moment of the day, based on the status quo and current conditions. If it didn't, a 140 person cutting 500 calories a day would literally vanish to nothingness in just three years. It's not possible. Ultimately, this is why dieters plateau. If you're on a diet with a 500 calorie deficit for like a month and you've lost some weight, your new needs are always actively changing. In other words, if you've lost 20 pounds from dieting and your predictive equations or calculators are suggesting that your new body weight should need about 500 calories less a day than your old body weight did, what we're actually finding is that no, because of this metabolic adaptation, you may actually need about 800 calories, for example, less than what you needed at baseline. And this is why permanent weight loss can become very, very difficult for people. But I'll need a whole other video to unpack that in more detail. So in conclusion, the calories in versus calories out concept absolutely works. If we're talking about a closed circuit environment, that is designed to never change. But humans do not operate in a vacuum, and weight loss is a multifactorial process that our bodies are evolutionarily built to reject 
and compensate for. I'm not saying that weight loss is impossible. I'm, I'm absolutely not saying that you will fail. And I'm not saying that calorie counting is bad or foolish or wrong. I actually think that having some idea about how to read and compare food labels and having some general calorie and nutrient knowledge is usually quite helpful, especially if you're trying to lose or gain weight. But there's a difference to me between calorie knowledge or using calories as like a general guideline and strictly counting every single calorie that you consume or burn. Because as you can now see, it's imprecise. At the end of the day, all I'm really saying is that we should have more empathy for ourselves when, you know, a program that's been served to us as being so simple and foolproof turns out not to be. Now, I'm reflecting on this experience I know how discouraging it may have felt to be seemingly told that calorie counting is like a fraud. It's not. And I am really sorry if I made it seem that way. Calorie counting has worked for a lot of folks and it could definitely work for you. But if it doesn't, there are other gentle approaches as well. So again, I have a whole video on gentle tips for weight loss right here, but in short, some of them include having an additive approach to meals, like making sure to include produce in most meals and snacks, dressing up our naked carbs by turning them into hunger crushing combos, reducing our reliance on calorie rich beverages and choosing water most often, and things like managing our stress and sleep. Having knowledge of the general nutrition in foods can also fit into this without getting completely obsessive. And for a lot of people, having knowledge of the general nutrition in foods can also fit into this without it becoming obsessive. So I hope that this helped to clear that up a bit. And I hope that you can at least just kind of see this as more data to inform your future eating choices. I also wanna give you a heads up that I have another great video on the way where I'm gonna be talking about the actual likelihood of you achieving long-term weight loss, as well as sharing some of the secrets from folks who have been able to lose weight and keep it off. So again, I'm not gonna tell you that this is impossible. I just wanna serve you the science. Leave me a comment below with your thoughts on calorie counting and anything else that you might wanna know in a future video. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and I hope to see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.